Our next speaker is a man that you really don't need to be introduced to. Remember I told you about tomorrow being the 37th anniversary of Bo marching his charges onto this field, beating Ohio State. Well, that tradition continues today. The excellence of the program, the fact that they do it the right way, all the tenants that Bo Schembechler set up here have continued on to the coaches that have followed. And this one has been nothing short of spectacular. A good friend of Bo Schembechler's, a great friend of Michigan, a good friend of all of us, and the head coach of the University of Michigan football program, Mr. Lloyd Carr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last Thursday at 2.20, I walked down the hallway of Schembechler Hall, and I had my last private conversation with Bo. I asked him how he was doing because in 15 minutes he was to address our team. And he told me that um, he was having a lot of trouble getting to sleep because he couldn't catch his breath. And he said to me, I can't live like this. But I'll finish that story in a few minutes. I want to take you back in my experience with Bo and tell you a few special memories that I have of him. March 12, 1980, I flew in from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to interview for a job on Coach Schembechler's staff here at Michigan. And I had been a high school coach here during the 70s and I had read all the stories about that famous Schembechler temper. And uh, so I went up to the office. We spent about an hour talking. And then he said, uh, you hungry? And I wasn't going to say no. So he grabbed Gary Moeller and Bill McCartney. He said, come on, let's go up to lunch. So we went up to the pretzel bell. And uh, we had lunch. And after lunch, we went back into the parking structure there behind the Real Seafood Company and Bo backed the car out of the stall. And as he did so, we heard this guy behind us laying on the horn. I mean, this guy was obviously irate. And evidently, he thought Bo had backed out in front of him. And uh, he just laid on this horn. Bo looked in his rearview mirror. And the guy had inched up. He was only inches from his bumper. Bo put the car in reverse. <laughs> and backed the car up. And then he put it back and forward. But before he could take his foot off the brake, the guy laid on the horn again. And Bo put the car back in reverse <laughs> and backed into him gently again and waited. And when there was no more blowing of the horn, he proceeded to leave the parking structure. <laughs> the great thing about Michigan staff meetings they were all precious, and you knew going in there every time. Uh, you, didn't, you couldn't anticipate what was going to happen. He loved to argue. And often he provoked the arguments, and then he would sit back while everybody else is yelling and screaming at each other. And as a coach, you always loved to see him get mad, as long as he was mad at one of the other coaches. <laughs> But in January 1982, I had an opportunity to see. You know, every coach talks about how they love their players. But in January 1982, we had just come back 
from the Blue Bonnet Bowl. We were out. The coaches were on, on the road recruiting. And uh, I called in the office on Tuesday, and Len Cook, Bo's secretary, said, Bo wants to talk to you. And he began to tell me about this offer that he had to go to Texas A&M University. And uh, I could tell that he was conflicted. Um, and I hung up. And the next day, we all got calls to come back into the office. And then he set up a meeting at his house uh, with the staff. And when we got there, he asked each of us what we thought about him taking the job at Texas A&M. And they had offered to make him the highest paid coach in college football. Enough money that he would have financial security for he and his family for the rest of his life. And uh, so we went around the room, and the staff was relatively divided about whether to go or whether to stay. And I'll never forget, at the end of the meeting, with a tear in his eye and with a crack in his voice, he said, yes, but you don't have to tell those players that you're leaving. Bo always knew what he wanted. One year, about 13 or 14 years ago, I went down the hall and I saw him. He had his bags with him and he was leaving. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Florida. I'm going on a fishing trip. So he left. About a week later, I see him in the office. He's got a grin on his face. He says, come on in here. I've got to tell you something. So I go into his office, he shuts the door, he bends over his desk, he says, now, you can't repeat this. He says, you know, I went down, had a great time fishing, he said, but the night before we left to go out, I went to this party. And I looked over in the corner of this room the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life. And he said, so we went out fishing, and we came back, and I got her name, and I asked her to go out with me. He says, now I'm telling you, this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And he says, and I'm going to marry her. And he did. I thought to myself, Bo, you've only known this woman a week, but he knew. And those next 13 years with Kathy Schimbeckler, I can promise you anybody who knows them knows what an incredible relationship, incredible marriage they had.